All right. I, I think we'll get started uh, with the panel. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining. A welcome to our to our panel on the use of race, ethnicity, and ancestry in research. This is part of Cell Press's Inclusive Language Speaker Series, which we launched 2022 to bring perspectives from leading experts to help us make the language of scientific publishing more accurate and more inclusive. We've already had two panels in this series, one early this year on improving the language of sex and gender in research, moderated by Isabel Goldman, our IND officer and leading edge editor at Cell, and another one last month on best practices for visual communication and scholarly publishing, moderated by Philip Grzminski, who is our illustration and design program manager. This brings me to today's panel on the use of race, ethnicity, and ancestry in research. Race, ethnicity, and ancestry are population descriptors that are frequently used as variables in human research. There are no standard or universally accepted definitions of these terms, just led to confusion regarding their usage. This has in turn led to in interchangeable use of these concepts or misusing, for example, race as a proxy for um, variable, a proxy for genetic variation. This sort of misuse results in inaccurate, imprecise, misleading, and potentially harmful science that disproportionately affects historically underrepresented groups. Through this panel, one of the most salient points that we hope to drive home is that there is no genetic basis to race. In today's panel, we will discuss the use of these terms, the pitfalls associated with using them interchangeably, the best practices for defining them in publications, and self-reporting of these descriptors, among other topics. We have three expert speakers joining us for this panel, Dr. Sonia Anand from McMaster University, Dr. Courtney Bonham from University of California at Santa Cruz, and Dr. Alice Popejoy from University of California, Davis. We will have a short presentation, which will last around 10 minutes from each of the panelists, followed by a brief discussion where attendees will have the opportunity to post their questions to the panelists. As you can see, the chat option is disabled, but please use the Q&A button to post your questions. Apparently, the chat is not completely disabled, but in any case, please use the Q&A button to post your questions. If you would like to direct your questions to a specific panelist, please include the name of that panelist before your question. And at this point, I would all like to give a quick shout out and thank you to Madeline Myers, who is co-moderating this panel. With that, let's get started with our first panelist, Dr. Sonia Anand. Dr. Anand is a professor of medicine and epidemiology at McMaster University, the director of Chanchalani Research Center focused on health equity research and a senior scientist at the Population Health Research Institute. Dr. Anand's present research focuses on the environmental and genetic determinants of vascular disease in population of varying ancestral origin women and cardiovascular disease. In 2019, she was inducted as a fellow to the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. In 2020, she received the Lifetime Achievement Award for Diabetes from the South Asian Health Foundation, UK. In 2022, Dr. Anand received the Margulies National Heart Disorders Prize and was inducted as a fellow of the Royal Canada. In 2023, she was awarded the YWCA Women of Distinction Award. As of July 2023, Dr. Anand has taken the role of Associate Vice President Global Health. With that, over to you, Sonia, um, with the presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Shankar, uh, for that kind introduction, as well as uh, convening this symposium. I'm really excited to hear from our fellow presenters and to take questions. So for uh, my presentation, I will review um, terms such as ethnicity, race, and ancestry, and link them to how we may see them used in health research to show some examples from population health research, RCTs, and genetic studies um, with respect to these terms, and then to end up with some um, recommendations with respect to how we may go forward and use these terms in a standardized way. So when I began research uh, a long time ago now, uh, I was completing my PhD and really focusing in on why certain ethnic groups uh, developed early onset heart disease. And that led me to try and reflect on the use of some of the terms in the literature at the time, which went back and forth between ethnicity, ethnic diversity, and race. And uh, after my review of the literature and the history at that time, I really um, wanted to minimize the use of the term race and focus um, on the term ethnicity, which is broader in scope and often, uh, you know, focuses in on the uh, cultural uh, shared um, components, uh, common languages, common foods consumed, and sometimes some biologic variation between cultural or ethnic groups. 
So this was back in 1999, as you can see. And since that time, there has been an explosion of different research designs, different types of studies, and most importantly, the use of uh, genome-wide association studies. And then I would also add to that uh, more of a social reckoning with respect to race, uh, racial groups, and racialization in our healthcare systems. So uh, if I can advance here. I'm having a, there we go. Okay. So I live in Canada and uh, we're a very multi-ethnic country and we typically have not used uh, historically the term race. Really, this comes, I think, predominantly from the United States, uh, whereby the census has collected race categories and you can see the five race categories so white black or african american asian american native hawaiian or pacific islander native american slash alaska native and uh, there is now a category for people of two or more races and i believe an addition of ethnicity example being hispanic or latino this was always a a very um strange classification from my perspective, because it was really based on physical characteristics uh, and did not incorporate variations within physical uh, uh, classification. So for example, being of South Asian ancestry coming from India originally, I would be grouped into Asian American with people of Chinese origin, Southeast Asian, etc. And so this uh, is the United States classification. And often when I would submit my papers to American journals, I would be asked to change my use of the term ethnicity to race and also to fit my ethnic categories into race categories. In Canada, we have also had an evolution over time about how to collect information. And this comes from a national uh, population survey back in the early 90s. And you can see uh, we do use the term ethnic, but they're suboptimal categories. Uh, so for example, you could select Canadian, but having been born in Canada, you know, that would pose a problem for me being of South Asian origin, but born in Canada. You can see it's often really listed by language uh, rather than other characteristics. So this wasn't a perfect classification. And in many of our uh, observational studies and clinical trials, we've had a discussion about what is the best practice with respect to collecting this information. And we've landed on the term ethnicity. And you can see a description of this that it would appear on our case record forms. And we also ask the participant to self-report. And I think you'll hear that throughout the presentations today, that the most robust uh, measure of ethnicity is that which is self-reported because observer identified or categorized uh, ethnicity or race is problematic. When it comes to race and its limitations, I know my colleagues will also review this, but race really is a social construct first, as I demonstrated with the census categories based on physical characteristics only. It's a crude description. It doesn't include uh, variations of ethnicity. Often race differences are interpreted as biological differences. And I think this is the greatest harm that has been experienced. Uh, when people use the term race, categorized by participants in studies by race, and then draw a straight line between racial difference and a biological difference. Uh, and as we use the classification and continue to use a classification based on race, it does perpetuate, perpetuate what is called race science. Uh, if race is to be used, and I think it will stay with us given that there is significant uh, differences in healthcare delivery and uh, treatment in the healthcare system by race. Uh, if race will perpetuate within our systems, then it should be self-reported as opposed to observer assigned, uh, which uh, is problematic, uh, less problematic that, uh, for certain 
racial categorized people such as black people and white people, uh, but very uh, uh, inaccurate when it comes to uh, people who are in the middle. And I want to uh, just provide an example from my field in cardiovascular medicine, where uh, a simple subgroup analysis by race led to uh, a lot of uh, controversy with respect to uh, optimal medication use in patients with left ventricular dysfunction. And so this is use of ACE inhibitors in patients with this condition. A large randomized trial was conducted. Overall ACE inhibitors were found to be effective. And then a subgroup analysis was done by race. And they conclude that uh, black people do not benefit from ACE inhibitors uh, and white people do. And this led to uh, you know, three decades uh, of additional research trying to find the biologic difference. It led to a very effective cap class of medications not being incorporated into guidelines for uh, African origin individuals and other harms. So I think that this one for me is a cautionary example of the limitations of race on top of the limitations of subgroup analyses and randomized trials. Now, with respect to ethnicity, the term refers to shared cultural characteristics. It's broader in scope. It considers uh, sociocultural uh, similarities and subgroups, uh, language concordance, uh, food concordance, sometimes religion. And sometimes this category by ethnic group can reflect biological differences. Now, we uh, prefer self-reported ethnicity uh, over observer assigned ethnicity. And the reason I say that is when we have measured self-reported ethnicity over time, we see that individual self-report of their ethnicity is not 100% re reproducible and it's a dynamic construct. So on a given day, an individual may report their South Asian ethnicity on another day, they may report uh, another one, such as I showed you a category called Canadian. So we've observed in our own studies that over time, the self-reporting varies and that can be context dependent, uh, the setting the individuals in, uh, their experience in the week beforehand, et cetera. And so for prospective studies, we do also recommend that this ethnicity classification uh, be measured at each visit so that one doesn't just use a one-time self-report as the ethnic category. And in my own work in ethnic variations in cardiovascular disease, uh, I, I will demonstrate that this classification by ethnicity has led to observations of different prevalence of conditions such as type two diabetes and the metabolic syndrome that then has led us to focus in on the high risk group and try and understand if there is a genetic underpinning to explain the prevalence of some of these risk factors. So there is a role of going from an ethnic uh, classification observation, and then to the next step to try and understand if there's a biological basis. But I think most of us today will come back to uh, the importance of a researcher being very clear on what is the research question with respect to ethnicity. And ancestry uh, refers to your ancestors. It can be based uh, and defined on geography, genealogy, or genetics. Uh, I think that Alice will go into this in more depth, but humans share uh, the vast majority of the same DNA and the genetic variation we study uh, represents a very small proportion of our genome. And the ideal uh, scenario when we're looking at genetic variations in, in accordance with ancestry is to use both the self-reported ancestry uh, and genetically inferred ancestry together. And this uh, is a term that other researchers have used, harmonized ethnicity race ancestry variable or HAIR, which checks for both. And there have been, as uh, I show in the bottom panel, at times in our studies where we have asked for self-reported ethnicity, uh, there is missing data uh, 
And then we use the genetic principal component analysis cluster to uh, group an individual with missing data into uh, a genetic inferred ancestry group. And then we can go back and impute a probable uh, ethnicity into that category. So that's an example of where we are using the genetic informed ancestry uh, to help in research. But I would caution against uh, uh, only using genetically inferred ancestry in non-genetic focused studies. So that's an example of where maybe you didn't ask the question of self-reported ethnicity or race, but you did collect DNA, you do have ancestry categories, and now you decide to ask a non-genetic question using those uh, genetic data to classify people by ethnicity or race, because it doesn't carry with it uh, the uh, importance of self-report and the common non-genetic factors that certain ethnic groups carry. And in a recent publication, we did uh, try and bring some standardization to the use of the terms. Uh, you can see race representing a social construct based on physical attributes, uh, it is used in healthcare research, um, and racial differences often reflect social inequalities and do not reflect biological variations. I think that's really important to understand. Uh, ethnicity is a multidimensional construct based on common cultural attributes. Self-reported ethnicity is preferred. And ancestry uh, refers to a common line of geographic, genealogic, or genetic descent. And you can see there are arrows in between that do refer to when two of these terms could be used in the same analyses. And again, um, because they can overlap in a given research question, the definition is really important and also best practices with respect to the use of the term is important. So to, to summarize, collection of self-reported ethnicity, race, or ancestry should be prioritized over observer assigned. Self-reported ethnicity or race is not 100% reliable over time. It's a dynamic construct, so that should be kept in mind, especially in research studies. Self-reported ethnicity or race is more accurate than observer assigned ethnicity or race, especially for people who are not clearly observably white or black. Uh, for genetic association studies, use of self-reported ethnicity together with genetically inferred uh, ancestry is uh, preferred. And finally, and a very crucial point, when interpreting and reporting health research data comparing ethnicity, race, or ancestry, researchers should frame their data in a manner that maximizes the potential benefit to their study participants and very carefully consider if harm could be done or could occur through stigmatization or through perpetuating racism. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, Sonia, for that very clear presentation, including also examples on uh, on misuse and um, what, what it leads to. With that, we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Courtney Bonham. Uh, Dr. Courtney Bonham is an assistant professor of psychology and critical race and ethnic studies at the University of California at Santa Cruz. She researches racial stereotyping as it shapes social perceptions and judgments relevant to racial inequalities in health, wealth, and well-being. Her work, her work focuses on two understudied targets, physical spaces and multiracial people, to highlight the social construction of race and expand dominant psychological approaches to studying race. Dr. Burnham also examines how social justice education can mitigate psychological processes that reinforce racial inequality. She has been awarded grants and fellowships from the Ford Foundation, the University of California Chancellor's Postdoctoral Fellowship Program, and the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues and the American Psychological Association. Over to you, Courtney. Oh, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, for being here today and for inviting me to speak with you about race, ethnicity, and ancestry. I'll focus my comments on how people constructed race, 
the social nature of it all um, and how it's often conflated with biogeographic ancestry. Um, and then I'll end by providing you with a clear definition of race and ethnicity and a few recommendations. And I just wanna say I co-sign onto everything that Dr. Anand just shared in my talk. We'll just kind of have a, a slightly different emphasis. I'm a social scientist. So, you know, my emphasis will align with that kind of focusing more on the social um, processes related to race and ethnicity. And before I um, really move on to my talk, I wanna just highlight that throughout my talk, the findings I described, they're, they're drawn from US American samples. Um, and so I'll be talking about race and ethnicity within the US American context, um, because that's the context my research focuses on. Um, but the patterns and processes really are relevant throughout the world. They don't always operate in exactly the same way, um, though. So it's important to consider both the distinctions and parallels by nation. Um, okay, so social science research shows us that most US Americans unfortunately misunderstand race as a fixed natural and normal human classification system that's rooted in biology and genetics. And the basis for forming racial categories is however anything but natural. So Carl Linnaeus, um, a European taxonomist, devised um, race as a human classification system in the 1700s, and he used superficial physical characteristics and stereotypes about temperament to place humans into four discrete categories. So these four discrete categories roughly aligned with the four largest geographic regions, Africa, Europe, Asia, and the Americas. So, um, Europeus was one of the categories. These this, members of this group were thought to be haughty and opinionated. Asiaticus was thought to be inflexible and inventive. Americanus was thought to be tenacious and free. And Affair was thought to be negligent and erratic. So Linnaeus and his contemporaries, they imposed these supposed stark boundaries and um, meanings onto gradual variation in phenotypic characteristics like skin tone and hair texture to create racial categories, um, which overgeneralized variation. They imposed really a social order onto these groups um, and even <clears throat> really an even more explicit and concrete classification system. So they, they created a racial hierarchy. And among European scholars at the time, this group was thought to be um, the origin of the human species. So the Euro European group was thought to be the origin of the human species and the most beautiful people in the world, um, knowledge that was supported by both the religion and the science of the day, um, the faulty science of the day. So for instance, by supposed differences in cranial size and shape and um, thus intelligence. Then in the late 1800s, prominent academics described Africans um, by nature as animal-like and requiring subordination by Europeans to be civilized. So this kind of reasoning was used to defend enslaving African people on the eve of abolition in the United States. And really the grave error in this motivated line of reasoning is really no more evident than in the fact that since the 1800s, racial categories have shifted over time and across geographic locales. Um, so for example, when Irish and Italian people first immigrated to the US, they weren't considered white um, and they too were depicted um, with ape-like qualities in cartoons and writings um, on the, at the time highlighting the relationship between race, racial categories, and the ever-changing social and historical contexts that shape people's lives. Also, uh, when I was born, my parents could only check one box for me on the census, um, and they checked Black, but by the time I graduated from high school, the multiracial movement had taken off, and I had the option to check both Black and white on the census, which I did. Um, now, because how I identify has shifted, when I complete the, sec the census, I check only Black. Um, so as you can see in these two examples, even though racial categories themselves have shifted over time, race stands out among other social categorization systems as being consistently central to maintaining <clears throat> social inequality. Um, and here are just a few examples of the laws and policies that have created and reinforced racial inequities. So laws recorded as early as 1740 in, um, into the 19th century passed anti-literacy laws for enslaved Africans. Um, so Africans define these laws based fines, jail, and severe whippings as punishment. 
um, when the Supreme Court decided the Plessy v. Ferguson case in 1896, their decision affirmed legal segregation in trains, buses, schools, and housing. And in 1944, um, President Roosevelt enacted the GI Bill, which, um, among other things, provided a path to home ownership for veterans um, in the US and their families. But this benefit was restricted to white veterans. So these laws and policies, among many others, they have codified race so much so that today the predominant way of conceptualizing race is to think of it as being biologically derived. Um, this misunderstanding of race as biologically de derived, it was waning, but its resurgence stems from more recent work in genetics um, that mapped the human genome. Um, and so direct to consumer DNA tests, like those from Ancestry.com and 23andMe, allow scientists to use genetic markers to tell people their biogeographic ancestry, which refers to the portion of one's DNA that provides a really good guess um, as to where their ancestors were living a long time ago. So these genetic markers of biogeographic ancestry make up just a tiny amount, um, less than 0.1% of the human genome. So even though biogeographic biogeographic ancestry does not equate to race, people often mistakenly assume that it does. So, and that's to harmful effect for people of color. So for example, Drexler James, a collaborator of mine, and I, we've conducted a series of experiments where we ask people to tell us what they think about a person um, who we give them some, just some basic information about. One piece of information we provide is the target person's biogeographic ancestry. So we actually manipulate the amount of sub-Saharan biogeographic ancestry that the target person has. And we find that the more um, African biogeographic ancestry the target person has, the more our participants are likely to racially categorize the target person as Black, assume the target person shares more genes with Black people, um, and this assumption about shared Black genes actually leads our participants to assume that the target with more African biogeographic ancestry is more biologically different from white people and is more susceptible to certain physical and mental health disorders like hypertension, obesity, depression, PTSD. So people are assuming that biogeographic ancestry equates to race, um, even though we didn't frame it in that way. Um, and people are making a series of troubling downstream assumptions about the person based on this misunderstanding. So these assumptions are definitely false. Um, and I'm gonna skip this slide in the interest of time and I'll just say a little bit more broadly, just emphasize this point that, you know, in truth, our genetic variation is not like this. <laughs> it's more like this. Um, it overlaps virtually completely and there's more genetic variation within racial groups than there is between racial groups. Um, in other words, strictly genetically speaking, it's much more meaningful for us to all identify as human than as a specific biogeographic ancestry group. Um, and this fact that biogeographic ancestry is not a meaningful genetic distinction is also what tells us that race, as it was originally conceived, does not exist. So in other words, what we know about biogeographic ancestry tells us that race in the sense of innate, biologically derived, unchanging characteristics and traits does not exist. But because we've been treating people as if race works in this way, we've made it matter. So this constru construct now matters uh, for people's outcomes. Um, so that includes medical outcomes like cancer rates and maternal mortality rates, due to, for example, racial disparities in industrial pollution exposure or the chronic toxic stress that people of color experience from living in social context, contexts where they experience racial microaggressions on a daily basis. Um, so despite our genetic similarities, we simply cannot ignore race. Um, instead, we really have to acknowledge what this classification system has done and understand the social order it was designed to create and maintain. So when we truly develop this nuanced systemic understanding of race, we can see that we aren't born a race. We actually become a race, it's a process. Um, so race really isn't something that we are. It's not, sorry, it's not a static essence um, or a trait that people possess. It's not something that's inside of us. 
Race is instead something that we do. It's the actions that people perform and the systems that we're all a part of. So race is a doing. It's a dynamic set of historically derived and institutionalized ideas and practices. It sorts people into ethnic groups according to perceived physical and behavioral human characteristics um, that are often imagined to be negative and, and shared. Um, this negative process also um, associates differential value, power, and privilege based on these characteristics. It establishes a hierarchy among different groups of people, and it confers opportunity according to that hierarchy. Race emerges when groups um, are perceived to pose a threat to each other, um, to each other's worldview or way of life, and it's often used to justify belitt belittling people of color or exploiting them, and it also claims um, white people's privilege um, or, um, uh, you know, it, yeah, it justifies white people's privilege. So ethnicity and contrast is a more positive process. So this is one way of conceptualizing ethnicity and contrast to race. Um, it's also a doing, so it's a, di a dynamic set of historically derived and institutionalized ideas and practices. It allows people to identify or be identified with groups of people on the basis of their presu presumed or usually claimed commonalities. Um, so for example, common language, history, nation, ethnic ancestry, physical appearance, um, customs. Um, and then when people claim an ethnicity or multiple ethnicities, that can really be a positive source of collective and individual identity. And it also can confer um, a sense of belonging, pride and motivation. So these are, you know, this is a way to frame race and ethnicity that really focuses on these two things as social processes as opposed to internal stable characteristics. And so just reflecting on everything I've talked about, I just want to leave you with a few recommendations. So, you know, when conducting biomedical research, I agree, I think it's really important to define these terms very clearly um, and to use precise language. So for example, my research shows it's really important to distinguish between um, biogeographic ancestry, race, racial ancestry, and ethnic ancestry, because if you just use a, the term like biogeographic ancestry, for example, people will take away racial meaning fr from that. So it's important to like clearly define what the term is and be precise in your language. Um, and then it's also, I think, important to get serious about your understanding of what race is um, so, you know, I'm uh, challenging everyone here to become serious st students of critical race and ethnic studies to let this not be like the end point, but just the starting point in your journey to getting a real, a really more nuanced and deep understanding of what race and ethnicity are. And thanks for your time. Uh, thank you so much, Courtney. That was uh, truly inspiring. And uh, these three recommendations are crystal clear and will definitely serve as a primer to have a lot of people think more seriously about this. Um, with that, we'll move on to our final speaker. Um, the final panelist is Dr. Alice Popejoy. And Dr. Popejoy is an assistant professor in the Division of Epidemiology, Department of Public Health and Sciences at the University of California, Davis. And she's also an associate member of the Population Sciences and Health Disparities Program of the UC Davis Comprehensive Center. Dr. Pochoy conducted postdoctoral research at Stanford University in the Department of Biomedical Defense and the Stanford for Biomedical Ethics after receiving a PhD in public health genetics and a certificate in statistical genetics from the University of Washington. The Popejoy Public Health Genomics Lab, or the JOY Lab for short, at UC Davis Health operates at the intersections of computational genomics, popu human population genetics, clinical genetics, biomedical data science, and bioethics. Its members seek to conduct basic translational research to address root causes of health disparities and enhance equity. Over to you, Alice. Thank you so much for having me. Can you see my slides in presenter mode or is it in a full screen? Okay, great. Wonderful. I uh, know it's 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 in it's a if you can use slideshow on top, that should how about that? That works. Excellent. Thanks. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I'm just gonna go ahead and kick us off with some foundational questions. It's gonna structure my part of the of the panel today. First, this question of how we define populations in the first place in biomedical research and medicine. We say diverse populations all the time, but what do we mean? Um, and then the second is sort of a design question. It's a how might we? How might we represent diversity consistently and accurately? 
And third, what are the broader implications of publishing population-based results in genomics and other biomedical research? So I've asked many uh, different audiences. This one is from the National Academy's uh, public workshop last summer on the use of population descriptors, race, ethnicity, and ancestry. This question, what word or words come to mind when you think of a population? And almost every time I've done this, doesn't matter what part of the world I'm in, it tends to, um, it tends to mean to people a, just a group a group of people, and, and it's very contextual. So you have to further specify what is that group? It's a population of, et cetera. So just in the very basic premise that we know what a population is, I encourage us to consider that perhaps we need to be more specific. So there are many different factors that might contribute to somebody being identified as being in a population group or a category. Um, so firstly, how is a category defined and by whom? What is the purpose of the categorization in the first place? Why is it being asked? What's the context? Um, uh, who is asking a question? When and where? And then if there are missing data, let's say in research, who decides what happens when there's ambiguity there? Uh, what are people's motivations and what is their position relative to the person who about whom they're filling in information? And finally, how are the data actually collected? Are they multiple choice questions? Are there fill in the blank? What are the categories? And I think very importantly, um, do people who are answering these questions have autonomy agency and do they feel safe to self-identify in a way that's accurate um, and precise? So um, I'll just take one example in the U.S. context of this population descriptor, Hispanic, um, to demonstrate that over time this has changed. It really didn't show up on the U.S. Census until 1980. Um, and uh, and where you are in the world also matters. So we think of Hispanic in the U.S. as you know as sort of Latin American communities, and we'll talk about that more broadly. But if you're in Brazil, these are the categories that they use um, in English, translated to yellow, white, indigenous, brown, and black. Um, in uh, in Mexico, there's just a singular national Mexican identity um, that was a pretty much an act of the government to try and erase uh, indigenous identities. And in Argentina, there's this sort of um, recognition that that everybody's kind of mixed. There's this there's this melting pot, right? Um, and then where you are and why you're answering questions about um, about self-identified race or ethnicity in this context might change depending on whether you're enrolling in research or whether you're applying for a job or you're in your own doctor's office. So I think it's very important to just double down on what the previous presenters have talked about and, and that there is a history of, of racial classification. And in particular in the US, this has been, it's very recent that, that Jim Crow laws separated people on the basis of skin color, even for as important things as medical care. And this is based on the underlying um, assumption that scientific, there is something scientifically different. We can measure this, that there is something biologically that is separating people on the basis of, of what we can see in the racial stereotypes that we associate with physical traits. And, and that belief is just completely unfounded in, in science and, uh, and by genetics. And I'll talk about more about that in a moment. But I think what's important also to recognize um, is that because of this this long history of racial classification that has been embedded into our clinical care systems and into our systems and structures, we sometimes take it for granted and we forget that it originally came from a system of classification and hierarchies that is that was used to justify slavery and colonization, extraction, exploitation, attempted genocide, etc. So this 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 notion that humans can even be separated into neatly defined categories at all comes from from a desire to separate us, to create hierarchies of power, and to maintain those hierarchies of power over time. So, um, uh, as as we as we are are both looking at this history, and we're having a sort of um, a sense that that it's that it it just is what it is, and it's it's the sort of natural thing that we have these racial and ethnic categories. It's really not. And when we look down into the genomes, um, and Dick Lewin did that did this in the 1970s, looking at these traditional race categories of humans he found that the vast majority of genetic variation is within these population groups. So you've seen this uh, earlier in this panel that, that all racial groups or however these groups are typically defined are genetically alike because we all share the same sets of just a very small proportion of variants um, across our genomes. 
So uh, in the 1970s, we had this famous population geneticist telling us that racial classification is of virtually no genetic or taxonomic significance and no justification can be offered for its continuance. And yet, as we know, in the US, um, we still have these race and ethnicity census categories. And initially, this was this was uh, mandated to the uh, NIH and other federally funded research um, entities within uh, uh, Health and Human Services. It was an act of Congress in 1993 that was designed to actually make biomedical research more diverse. The Women's Caucus and the Congressional Black Caucus got together and said, we need to make sure that it's not just white men in biomedical research. So let's track this information. But the ones of that was that then researchers were forced to put their research subjects into these artificially constructed categories and then, you know, had had stratified data that they could run categorical analyses on, um, typically with statistical methods that we still use today, most of which were developed in the early 1900s by um, eugenicists such as R.A. Fisher uh, and Carl Pearson, who studied under Francis Galton. So we, we have this legacy that persists even in the way that we that we conduct our science and using these unscientific uh, race ethnicity categories. So I wanted to learn a bit more about how we actually think about, about these, these terms. So I asked the question about um, how people think about population, but also ancestry, ethnicity, and, and race um, over a series of, of talks. And these are the basic findings, that people think of population as about ancestry, culture, geography, that ancestry, people think about um, family lineage, history, heritage, and genetics. And then ethnicity is almost always about culture for folks, thinking about your cultural background. And race is really about racism. It's just the idea that um, you can group people by physical appearance and typically thinking about, about skin color. So, but when we go to do our, our research, uh, we are, particularly myself, I'm a computational researcher, so I don't collect my own human data, but I use data sets that already exist. And if I wanna go to the UK Biobank and, and do a genetic study, um, uh, I'd be, you know, I'm pretty disappointed when I look at the orders of magnitude difference of data that I have for white British um, versus all of the other categories. And when you look at these categories from the US perspective, it's a little um, strange because Chinese is not in the Asian category. And we typically consider that that to be um, a definite defining here. But um, but in the UK, Chinese is a separate sort of social, political, cultural category. So it's taken out. And then when you really start thinking about words like Asian, that's more than half the world's population if you mean it geographically, but it's really unclear how you would map even a UK version of Asian uh, category and a US version, which would certainly be used to describe Chinese, for example. So when you have these census categories that are, um, that are used to describe your biological data sets, then any results that you publish using these descriptors for the samples is going to reinforce false notions of how people can naturally and should naturally be grouped for the purpose of research. So um, uh, in genetics, we often um, look to this uh, statistic called allele frequency, which is just the number of times you've seen some genetic variant in some population, however that's defined. And it actually turns out it matters a lot how it's defined uh, when, you're, when you're calculating these frequencies. And as you can see in, in um, the NOMAD categories that are used to report these allele frequencies, this is the, the database of um, genomes and is the, the update to the exact server. And they actually construct these categories using something called principal component analysis, which I'll talk about in a moment, perhaps you've heard of it. And then they say, well, these are valid because we've done the statistical approach to grouping people and then this is how we report our frequencies. But if you look at these categories, African slash African-American, well, African, that's an entire continent, and it's the ancestral home of our homeland of our entire species. So <laughs> there's so much genetic diversity within Africa that to say that a point estimate like a frequency of a particular genetic variant is, is kind of nonsensical. And the reliance on this principal component analysis or PCA really stems from, I think, largely this paper in 2008 by John Novembre. And they took data from this POPRES data set across Europe, and they found that, wow, we can actually see the geography of Europe in these genotypes and their frequencies across um, geography, across latitude and longitude. But the only reason that this worked, among many things that they did um, sort of experimentally to, to, to actually get this to work, 
uh, is that humans migrated in a north, in a south to north and an east to west kind of a way across the Europe. So that means that our genotype frequencies just happen to be in clines that correspond to latitude and longitude. But that's not the case for island migration situations or any other migration situations where this isn't perfectly aligned um, in this way. And, you know, Europeans are a very... Um, uh, a, a tightly bottlenecked uh, population. So there was a reduction in genetic diversity as populations moved out of Africa and then a subsequent expansion with not very many new variants being added. So that means that when I go to Norway to talk to my Norwegian cousins, they won't let me use the Norwegian word for cousin, which is kusinet. It's der schlecht, distant relations, right? So this is just sort of an artificial look at, at what PCA can do. And it wasn't the panacea that, that folks thought it was at the time. Um, so, so John Novembre has done um, a lot of subsequent work to demonstrate sort of that how this, this paper that he published was misleading that, that PCA and other admixture analyses, they do a poor job of conveying absolute levels of differentiation. So you're not actually really looking at large differences in these real clusters, you're sort of artificially separating them using lots and lots of different loci across the genome. So we said, even though you observe these genetic clusters, this can give this misleading impression that there's just deep differentiation between you know, populations, uh, even though these come from really subtle frequency differences at a really large number of loci across the genome. So when you look at actual sort of concentration maps of allele frequencies, even the Duffy blood group allele, which was traditionally used to sort of racially group um, populations by, by genetics, um, you can see that, that even the alleles that are highly selected for because of their protective effects against malaria in certain parts of the world, um, they're still not only restricted to one continent, for example, and they're not everywhere in all continents. So there's no individual continent specific allele, although there are differences in relative frequencies. So when this is reality and you're being reported uh, allele frequencies by these six or you know 10 population groups, um, that's a real problem. So how, how might we do this uh, representing diversity? I first got into this in 2016 as a grad student with Malia Fullerton at University of Washington and sort of updating this 96% European ancestry statistic from 2009 and found that roughly 81% of genome-wide association studies were people of European uh, descent, which is a big problem, but I don't want to focus on that. What I'm focusing on is the descriptors that were actually in the publications that were in the GWAS catalog that I had to sort of parse out. Um, and it was all over the place. You know, how you had things like um, Hispanic ancestry, like, what does that even mean? So, you know, we had these categories and all these descriptors. It was actually very difficult to figure out how you're going to take all this, this, um, you know, all these differences and how people are described and forcing them into these, into these, uh, these boxes. And similarly, um, as a postdoc at Stanford and uh, at ClinGen, we looked at different um, clinical genetic testing forms and found that no uh, two forms between any companies were exactly the same categories or even called the same thing from ethnicity to ancestry to geo ancestry. So there's no standardization um, at all. Uh, um, Alice, if if just just to just to let you know sure. that we would like to have at least 10 minutes for questions. So sure. if you could okay. wrap. Yeah, just just to just sure to give your heads up about that. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. So um, they have been there have been some standards implemented um, uh, since then for the GWAS catalog. This is the uh, human ancestry ontology here at the left and then some other efforts, but they just fall short. So what could you do? Well, we could look at global representation and compare it to ancestry. But that's still problematic. Um, we have to pay attention to the figures that we use and the references that we use. So if we look at, at this plot right here, it seems as if all the continents have sort of roughly equal proportions of these homogeneous ancestries. But when you use reference panels from across African populations, you really see viscerally how any two individuals randomly selected from Africa compared to, say, someone with European ancestry like myself, well, both of them would be more similar genetically to me than they would be to one another on average. We also have guidance out of the National Academies. We can maybe talk more about this in the discussion. But the main thing to know is that they, they encourage us to avoid typological thinking and also to have respect for communities and do engagement. So if you ever see a publication on the thousand genomes data, these are the categories that the community engaged participants in that 
uh, database agreed to be used about them, not the continental level categories. So there are broader implications of this, including thinking about colonization across across the globe. And um, in California, we have um, indigenous tribes that uh, have been here for at least 10,000 years. So if we think about how we might group people together, we could think about using sort of indigenous and native ways of doing things. But in general, the, the most important things I want you to take home is that all of these different sort of cluster-based based methods that we're seeing now in, in research um, can, can contribute to misconceptions and mistakes and interpretation of what they actually mean for human diversity. So I don't, I won't read them all here, but um, there is a fantastic paper uh, by Kyle Brothers, Robin Bennett, and Mildred Cho, who were um, representatives from the Editorial Board of Genetics and Medicine, um, giving some very concrete, specific recommendations for publishers um, on these topics. So with that, I will uh, thank you for having me and we can go to the discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Alice. And thanks to everyone, all the three panelists for your presentations. It was very, very clear and uh, very um, and extremely inspiring uh, to actually see them and also to look at the history. So just to quickly start us off for the discussion, um, we will get through the questions in the chat. Um, uh, 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 if any anybody can take over as, as uh, short answers if possible. Uh, I'd be one of the panelists actually asked if uh, mentioned that they would be interested to know more about how the changes in self-reported ethnicity are best handled in longitudinal studies or say when it changes from parent reported to ad ad adolescent reported over time. Uh, maybe I'll take that, Shankar, if that's okay. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, Sure. So, I mean, that's a great question. And I think the my answer would be depends on the question. So, for example, if you were trying to understand the impact of ethnic variations in type 2 diabetes incidence and in classified people as South Asian versus not, um, I think you would uh, be it would be reasonable to take the baseline classification. I would examine in a cohort study how concordant responses were over time. And I would be concerned about using baseline if I saw uh, the concordance drop below a certain threshold. You know, I could set that at 75% or something of that nature. On the other hand, if the question is about accessing health services and uh, you're looking at one point in time to get contemporary data, I would use the individual's most recently reported ethnicity. From the perspective of parents to children, that's a great question uh, because we know that is uh, sometimes not concordant when we're talking about gender. And so I think in that case, again, depends on the question. And if you're really trying to get at, for example, children's experience in school with respect to, uh, you know, their their uh, educational attainment or participation on sports teams, then I would take the self reported of the child and I would be concerned about using the parents reported ethnicity. However, if it's a different question, maybe it's appropriate to use the parents report. So again, all that means there's, you know, um, decision making in the fine details of the question at hand. What I see in the, in the reporting of research is there's not enough thought often around what is the question we're asking that might involve ethnicity or race. And you can see that in the writing of papers where multiple um, intermixing of terms are used. You start off in your abstract with ethnicity in the methods it's race and in the discussion it's ethnicity or race or ancestry. So. I think being precise uh, and recognizing where there are limitations of, of what you can do is, is the best approach. That's that's like that actually leads me to a question that I wanted to ask the panelist about the talking about precise language in publications. So I presume that this would involve obviously defining the context within which these terms are used with respect to the scientific question that the research is trying to address. But how would that look like? Would that look like a, a glossary in the beginning, followed by the research question, followed by the context? Or uh, I'm just trying to figure out how that would look like. I'll let someone else answer. <laughs> Um, Alice for oh, Courtney. Sure. Yeah, Alice, yeah, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it just, you know, it depends on the on the pub, the 
publisher and sort of, you know, what, what the preferences are of the journal, like stylistically in terms of, you know, I don't want to say whether you put a glossary or not, but I do think it's important that it's somewhere in the text that, that they, the terms that are being used need to be defined. I think most importantly, it needs to be explicitly stated why those terms and why that ontological framework or whatever classification scheme is being used is being used. And if there's a better way to do it, then, um, you know, I would really encourage editors and reviewers to push back on authors and say, hey, you know, why did, ask the question in, you know, in the review process, why did you, um, you know, use this method? It, you know, did you think about this other method? Could you do it that way? Just really um, pushing people to be as rigorous as we possibly can be so that we don't fall back onto lazy thinking that just reinforces these harmful um, stereotypes. And I think a lot of times people just don't know, right? Especially if they were raised in these. And, and I actually rewrote the chapter on um, population genetics for Thompson and Thompson. And I feel for the physicians who studied with that, the, the last version, because it's reporting allele frequencies by racial categories. So it can be very confusing in the educational materials as well. And sometimes researchers, um, a lot of times, I think, have a lot more um, work to do to unpack this. Great. Thanks a lot, Alice. And I can also see that you are already answering one of the questions in the chat. So thank you for that. Uh, I do have a question for Courtney. Oh, um, just, oh yeah, go oh, ahead. Sorry, Courtney. I'll just briefly add in response to your Absolutely. last. I think it's in addition to defining terms, I also think it's important to just provide like a brief explanation of what some terms that are frequently conflated with race don't mm. mean. So just a brief explanation that like, for example, genetic ancestry is not the same thing as racial ancestry and you know just to prevent people from making these assumptions that we're so primed to make within our broader culture right that actually was one is in line with one, with one of the questions that i wanted to ask you because i think it's it's clear and it's very obvious that there's no genetic basis to race but uh looking at your presentation courtney i'm just trying to figure out biological basis to race and this is and i just wanted to hear your thoughts on that um, well, there is no biological basis yeah. to race. <laughs> That's right. my thought on that. But yeah. I mean, there because of how we treat people based on their race, um, those systems and structures have medical consequences. So, for example, you know, there are racial disparities in the extent to which populations like uh, in the U.S. are exposed, racial groups are exposed to industrial pollution, and that has a negative effect on a whole range of health outcomes like cancer rates, infant mortality rates, maternal mortality rates. Um, and so we've made race matter biologically, not because of any in, any kind of innate or immutable traits that are yeah. inside of people, but because of the laws and policies um, how we physically structure our environments, how where we tell people they can or cannot live. We've made race matter biologically due to all of those structural processes. Yeah, I think that's that's an incredibly important point to just the, the effects of it uh, is uh, to to get through. And thank you so much for making that incredibly clear because uh, be, because it's it's so important, especially in divided society uh, like ours. Uh, well, uh, there's with that I. Do not think there are any more questions in the chat. So, and thank you so much for answering the questions in the chat as they were coming in uh, both Sonia and uh, Alice. That was really helpful. And thank you to everyone for joining us for this panel. Thank you so much for the panelists to taking the time for taking the time. It's eight in eight in the morning in California. Thank you so much for Alice and Courtney to, uh, for actually making it this. Uh, it was wonderful. And we will have another panel on the language we use to describe the spectrum of health diseases disability. It'll be hosted by Amber Miller from Cell Metabolism, and it'll be held on the November, on the seventeenth of November from ten to eleven EST. Uh, thanks once again and um, to Robin for setting up the Zoom invitation, Madeline for co-moderating and for Isabel for helpful comments. It was an incredibly fantastic discussion. And with that, I would like to wish everyone a great day and bring today's panel to a close. Thanks. Bye.